Philadelphia is now a world heritage city. But what does that mean? Simply, and most technically, it means that first, Philadelphia has a world heritage site, a site which meets the standard established by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, for that designation. Since 1979, Independence Hall has been inscribed on the roster of UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Second, it means that, with that credential in hand, we have applied for and been admitted to membership in the organization of World Heritage Cities. That happened at the meeting of World Heritage Cities in Arequipa, Peru in November 2015, making us the first city in the United States to earn that distinction. That's important. Although accepting our own international significance may not come readily to us Philadelphians, it's time for us to stand up and say, that's us. And that's really what this project is about. It's as much about us recognizing what we are as it is about winning the recognition of others. Hi, I'm David Brownlee. I teach architectural history at the University of Pennsylvania. I think the case for Philadelphia to be a world heritage city is as simple as this. There is no other place on earth where one can see more clearly the tangible evidence of globally important human ideas and globally transformative human accomplishments. And although what happened at Independence Hall in the last quarter of the 18th century appropriately makes it the starting point for our World Heritage credentials, Philadelphia has something to celebrate in every era of our history and every corner of our region and every part of our multicultural community. This broader significance is already formally recognized. In addition to Independence Hall, 66 other Philadelphia buildings and 40 from the surrounding suburban counties are national historic landmarks, the highest American recognition. Philadelphia's accomplishments have not been easily achieved. And our history is full of experiments, failed as well as successful, and marked by strife. But our ideas and our idealism have prevailed. It's also important to remember that our heritage is not a thing of the distant past or just a list of handsome old buildings. We admire and protect those physical reminders because of what the people who lived in them and made them did and thought and the past in which that happened ended just a moment ago. In this film, we'll look into that relevant living heritage and at the drama that Philadelphians have enacted on the world stage throughout our history. This film will be divided into five acts with an interlude. To begin at the beginning, Philadelphia's founding in the 17th century was one of the boldest and most fully realized expressions of the Enlightenment. And starting at ground level, our 1683 grid plan bespeaks the rationalism of that era and of our founder, William Penn. The plan seems so ordinary, and it is, of course, still so much a part of our daily lives that we're usually blind to its internationally important revolutionary character. Penn's plan swept away as nowhere else the physical disorder of the largely medieval cities that he and his colonists had known in Europe. Cities plagued by disease and literally incendiary, as proven by the fiery destruction of London in 1666. Philadelphia's physical innovation served and emblematized an even more important social and political revolution. The multi-steepled 18th century city that rose and still rises on Penn's plan embodied a rational philosophy that left no room for religious prejudices. And his city's tolerance for diverse thinking of all kinds provided the setting for the subsequent invention of modern democracy. As you may know, Penn's ambitious plan for Philadelphia was for much more than a century a kind of abstraction, an ideal two-mile-wide grid running from river to river 
upon which real Philadelphians camped out at its eastern edge, crowding along the Delaware. But notably, astoundingly, even as they camped along its edge, our Philadelphia ancestors and their map makers kept the majestic image of Penn's optimistic idealism in mind. This idealism was literally official policy. In 1789, in the post-revolutionary rechartering of Philadelphia, Philadelphians placed an image of the city that they believed in, but which they did not yet inhabit, on the city's official seal. In short, late 18th and early 19th century Philadelphia was a city of ideas, which came to be known as the Athens of America. A clearly planned city where, in the same idealistic spirit in which the city was conceived, the blueprint of a new nation was drafted in 1776. That design work occurred in Independence Hall, and there was also written the American Diagram of Good Government, the Constitution of 1789. In addition, in those same decades, Philadelphia was the birthplace of the American movements to abolish slavery and to reform prisons. Those are among the greatest achievements of our species and the most impactful ideas in human history. In the streets of this city of ideas walked people, the first truly modern people, who by converting these ideas into deeds accomplished what no one but tyrants had been able to do before. They managed to change for themselves the conditions in which they lived. And it wasn't just ideas about the reordering of society that were born in Philadelphia. This capital of the new American Republic was also a leading international center of the arts and sciences. In the first important New World Museum, created in Philadelphia by Charles Wilson Peale, all of human knowledge was assembled encyclopedically. And the various branches of knowledge were served separately in a host of Philadelphia's pathbreaking institutions. The nation's first hospital, the Pennsylvania Hospital, its first secular university, Penn, the Library Company, the American Philosophical Society, the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, the Academy of Natural Sciences, and the Franklin Institute, whose name reminds us of Benjamin Franklin, the Philadelphian who epitomizes this era, who joined in founding most of these institutions, and whose brain could manage to do in one place what his many foundations did separately. But Philadelphia was not only an environment in which new ideas were hatched. It was also where they were tested. The rational orderliness of Benjamin Henry Latrobe's boldly experimental steam-powered water system, the first such system in the world, with its pump house located with geometric perfection in Center Square, proved too feeble to pump water to the entire city. And so it was replaced by a water-driven pumping station that sent water to Fairmount, where gravity could do the work of distributing it to the city. And the boldest architectural experiment conducted by this culture of life-changing ideas, Eastern State Penitentiary, which is probably the most copied building ever made, offers another salutary warning of the limitations of that kind of theorizing. Its ideal geometry was designed to operationalize the optimistic idea that criminality was a product of external corruptions and that the innate goodness and rationality of criminals would win out if the corruptions were kept away through keeping them in solitary confinement. Even in this city of unbounded idealism, this did not turn out to be true. But lessons can be learned. The Constitution, drafted in Philadelphia, was found to need amendments. And the first 10 of them, the Bill of Rights, were adopted while the US government resided here in the 1790s. Philadelphia's ability to invent and then reinvent itself, keeping idealism alive while grappling with reality, makes our story all the more potent and distinctive. This is, after all, the home of both the coolly rational grid plan and the curved mustard-spiced pretzel. 
And much of Philadelphia was developed literally off the grid, away from what is wrongly thought of as our only historic district. For this is a city of neighborhoods, although we never seem to be able to agree exactly how many there are or what their boundaries may be. The ethnically and topographically diverse profusion of neighborhoods began at the beginning, in the so-called liberties to the north and the south of the grid, and most distinctively in Germantown, where Penn encouraged German Quakers to settle when the colony was born. Here, there are all the features of our noblest Philadelphia mythologizing. A battle against the British fought in 1777 and reenacted, it seems, every year since. And a bevy of stately 18th century houses where important things happened. James Logan managed Penn's colony from Stenton, and President Washington governed the new republic from the Deschler Morris House when the government fled from downtown during the yellow fever epidemic of 1793. But Germantown's story, like all of Philadelphia's, is more complex than it seems at first. The Battle of Germantown was an American defeat, and Logan, Washington, and Benjamin Chu, who lived at Cliveden, had enslaved servants. Of course, we went on to win the war, and Germantown Quakers had been among the first in America to petition against slavery back in the 17th century, and their houses, notably the Johnson House, operated as stations of the Underground Railway in the 19th century. Germantown's more complicated than expected history also includes industrialization, because the German weavers established along its creeks Philadelphia's first large factories. Expanded in the 19th century, that industrialization attracted Philadelphia's first railroad. It connected Center City to Germantown and the other early industrial center in Maniunk, where the oldest railroad station in the United States still stands at Shawmont. With railroads also came suburbanization. Second Empire houses in the 1870s and Queen Anne shops on Germantown Avenue in the 1890s. A vital part of this history of Germantown and Philadelphia is continuous and continuing social change. African Americans who passed through Germantown on their way to freedom in the 1850s became its majority population in the 1950s. And while white flight was one part of Germantown's story, so too was a powerful progressive movement of citizens who banded together to promote an integrated Philadelphia neighborhood. Our city of neighborhoods was largely defined in the 19th century, when it grew gigantically, from 81,000 people in 1800 to 1 1.3 million in 1900, 16 times larger. And although we ceded the titles of America's capital to Washington in 1800, and America's largest city to New York at about the same time, 19th century Philadelphia still did colossal things in tune with the new industrial age. While remaining the center of American medicine and publishing and science, we also became the workshop of the world, challenging Birmingham and Manchester in England for international manufacturing supremacy at a time when Chicago, Detroit, and Pittsburgh were still small towns. We made almost everything, but the flag bearers were in heavy industry, supremely railway engines led by Baldwin Locomotive Works, which got up steam in 1831, and iron ships, the Navy Yard created in 1801, Cramps Shipyard, which was launched in 1831. This mighty city provided the materiel with which the Civil War was won, even as we had provided the ideas of equality and national unity for which the war was fought. These great things were not achieved without much strife, which tested our ideals. Early 19th century Philadelphia had the largest population of African Americans outside the South, and these free people incited the hostility of white competitors for employment in the industrial city. Irish Catholics, 75,000 of whom came here in the potato famine years, were received with similar fear and hate 
and riots and vandalism were frequent occurrences in the 1830s and 1840s. But the mighty engine of the industrial economy did create opportunities for the newcomers who continued to come from more and more places. And the city continued to grow with workers' neighborhoods, often defined by ethnicity as well as industry, growing up within walking distance of the mills. Textiles and the Irish defined Kensington. Germans and German-style beer making and architecture in Brewery Town. Textiles and a mixture of Irish, English, Scots, and Germans in Maniunk, where a hillside village rose above the water-powered mills, presided over by the tall-towered Catholic Church. In South Philadelphia, it was African Americans, then Irish and Italians and Latinos, who walked east or west to waterfront jobs on the Delaware and the Schuylkill. In Taconi, there is an exceptional case. When Harry Diston moved his saw works here, to a site on the Delaware, he also laid out and built a neighborhood of housing for his workers and established a subsidized mortgage system. In Frankfort and Port Richmond, the vast coal docks of the Reading Railroad and the adjacent Cramps Shipyard provided employment to an industrial army of Germans, Poles, and other Eastern European Catholics who lived in little houses and worshipped in great churches along Allegheny Avenue. In all of these distinctive neighborhoods, Philadelphia's workers lived in row houses, not in tenements or triple-deckers or rooming houses, and an enormous number of them owned their own homes. This was widely noted as distinctive, and it was much admired. Indeed, at the great Chicago Columbian Exhibition of 1893, a Philadelphia row house was displayed as the ideal working-class dwelling. Philadelphia, by the end of the 19th century, was a great mosaic of these row house neighborhoods. And their diversity was reinforced by the fact that until 1854, they were separately governed by 29 municipalities. But in that year, consolidation redefined the city of Philadelphia. Until then, it had officially consisted of just the two square miles of Penn's grid. Now, it would encompass all of these municipalities and all the 130 square miles of the county. This great change in governance, undertaken largely for reasons of public health and safety, was the first of several kinds of consolidation. Another began in 1858 with the introduction of the first streetcars, which by 1911 ran on almost every street of the metropolis, binding it together physically. So important were the streetcars to the life of the city that they were the focus of two of the most important struggles for civil rights. In the 1860s, Octavius Cato led a campaign of civil disobedience and lawsuits that gave African Americans the right to ride the trolleys. And in 1944, federal troops broke a wildcat strike by white trolley operators, giving African Americans the right to drive them. And finally, Consolidation allowed the development of the largest municipal park system in the world as a complement and a kind of antidote to Philadelphia's industrial giganticism. A network of green connecting Maniunk to Brewery Town, West Philadelphia, and Center City. In 1876, we invited all the world to a World's Fair in that park to celebrate the centennial of America in the city that had created it and saved it. The Centennial Exhibition was an international bragging fest of art and science in which Philadelphia presented itself with power and distinction. Notably, the greatest American painter of the age, Philadelphia's Thomas Aikens, displayed his first masterpiece, The Gross Clinic, in a scientific exhibition. While in the vast machinery hall, Baldwin locomotives were lined up like Chevys in a showroom. The crowning celebration of Philadelphia's industrial might and unity came with the decision in 1871 to build a new city hall in the center square of Penn's plan. After nearly 200 years, finally fulfilling the founder's vision of a symmetrical city governed from its center. To mark the occasion in the spirit of the industrial metropolis that surrounded it, City Hall was built to be the tallest building in the world, and its 548-foot iron tower 
held that title until 1908. That vertical superlative was matched in the horizontal plane by the building across the street, Broad Street Station, which was the headquarters of the largest corporation on earth, the Pennsylvania Railroad, as well as a gigantic railway terminal. As enlarged by Frank Furness and the Wilson brothers in 1893, its train shed was 300 feet wide, the largest unsubdivided space on the planet. Philadelphia thus began the 20th century in first place. The big train shed burnt down in 1923, and the rest of Broad Street Station was demolished in 1953. But Philadelphia still had, and has, the train station that the Reading Railroad had built at the same time and in a race with the Pensy in the 1890s, resulting in what was then the second largest train shed on earth, and now the largest at 259 feet. With astonishing foresight, even as we were marking these triumphs, this great workshop city was already planning for a post-industrial future. The city that had at last filled in Penn's grid, pushed industrial neighborhoods outward along the railroads and streetcar lines to fill the county, and which built the tallest building on earth at its center, where broad and market streets intersected in a crescendo of monuments of railroading, industry, and commerce, that city now proposed to add to those two axes a third axis, the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. It was conceived in the late 19th century, and starting in 1907, a still quite new industrial neighborhood of housing and factories, some 1,600 real estate parcels, was demolished to make way for it. The roadway opened in 1918, and it was then quite slowly populated with new buildings. Throughout this long period, the parkway was thought and rethought several times, even while it was being made, most splendidly but not definitively by Jacques Grébert. Other architects made important contributions too. Paul Cray, Horace Trumbauer, and an African-American, Julian Abel, whose creativity often went unrecognized. As intended by the business, civic, and artistic alliance that created it, the parkway was the symbolic and real axis around which Philadelphia began to reorganize itself as a city of culture, commerce, and education. As such, it is an internationally significant roadway metaphorical and real, from the industrial 19th century to a present and future of eds and meds, and much else. And it looks like the Champs-Élysées in Paris to boot, although that road was built to allow Louis XIV to get out of town and go hunting in the Bois de Boulogne, and is therefore much less important to history. Having been among the first industrial cities on Earth to contemplate a different future, in the years after World War II, Philadelphia was also in the international vanguard when it came to rethinking the destructive urban renewal projects that many industrial cities inflicted on themselves in that effort. In the post-war era, Philadelphia became a cover story as we successfully planned and executed the reuse of our rich and diverse past. The central episode in this story is the work of Ed Bacon and the reimagining of Society Hill. Bacon and his collaborators first presented their ideas for a transformed city, a better Philadelphia, in 1947, with a motorized model that prefigured the demolition of much and the dislocation of many, as occurred elsewhere. But the dockside neighborhood that is now Society Hill was transformed with a plan that preserved and restored more than 500 houses from the colonial and early federal periods, augmenting them with new buildings, like Society Hill Towers, that ask to be considered as modern landmarks. Nowhere else on Earth can one so completely immerse oneself in the Enlightenment world, where and when humans learned to change everything, something we've continued to do. Sadly, our great Victorian monuments of commerce and industry even the works of Frank Furness were not sufficiently appreciated at that time to be preserved. More recently, more happily, 
we have moved to preserve the great landmarks of our workshop of the world era. The Reading Terminal, its trains moved underground, but its market intact, has become the front door of the Pennsylvania Convention Center. The Art Museum, that was built as part of the Centennial Exhibition in Fairmount Park, has been reborn as the Please Touch Museum. And the restored shipyard buildings of the mighty Navy Yard are the centerpiece of the creative mixed-use reconceptualization of that huge property. In every season of its history, Philadelphia has made its mark on the world, and the markings of its greatness are still everywhere to be seen. That's been the basis of the case for Philadelphia to become a World Heritage City, starting from Independence Hall and then moving outward in time and space and through all of our cultural diversity. Of course, not enough people around the world and even in Philadelphia know this about our city. We owe it to them and to ourselves to share the inspiring story of what we've done. We've earned the title of World Heritage City. Now, the challenge is what to do next. I'm David Brownlee. Thanks for watching.